I do not approve of anything that tampers with natural ignorance. Ignorance is like a delicate exotic fruit. Touch it and the bloom is gone. The whole theory of modern education is radically unsound. Fortunately, in England at any rate, education produces no effect whatsoever. If it did, it would prove a serious danger to the upper classes and probably lead to acts of violence in Grosvenor Square. Uh, what is your income? Between seven and eight thousand a year. In land or in investment? In investments, chiefly. That is satisfactory. What between the duties expected from one during one's lifetime and the duties exacted from one after one's death, land has ceased to be either a profit or a pleasure. It gives one position and prevents one from keeping it up. That's all that can be said about land. I have a country house with some land, of course, attached to it, about 1,500 acres, I believe. Oh, but I don't depend on that for my real income. In fact, as far as I can make out, the poachers are the only people that make anything out of it. A country house? How many bedrooms? Uh, well, that point can be cleared up afterwards. Uh, you have a townhouse, I hope. A girl with a simple, unspoiled nature like Gwendolyn could hardly be expected to reside in the country. I own a house in Belgrave Square. But it is let by the year to Lady Bloxham. Of course, I can get it back any time I like at six months' notice. Lady Bloxham? I don't know her. Oh, she goes about very little. She's a lady considerably advanced in years. Ah, uh, nowadays that is no guarantee of respectability of character. What number, Belgrave Square? 149. The unfashionable side. I thought there was something. However, that could easily be altered. But do you mean the fashion or the side? Both, if necessary, I presume. What are your politics? Well, I'm afraid I really have none. I'm a liberal unionist. Oh, they count as Tories. They dine with us or come in the evening at any rate. No, two minor matters. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, might be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. Who was your father? He was evidently a man of some wealth. Was he born in what the radical papers call the purple of commerce? Or did he rise from the ranks of the aristocracy? I'm afraid I really don't know. The fact is, Lady Bracknell, I, I said I had lost my parents. It would be nearer the truth to say that my parents seem to have lost me. I don't actually know who I am by birth. I was... Well, I was found. Found? Yes, the late Mr. Thomas Cardia, an elderly gentleman of a very charitable and kindly disposition, found me and gave me the name of Worthing because he happened to have a first-class ticket for Worthing in his pocket at the time. Worthing is a place in Sussex. It is a seaside resort. And where did the charitable gentleman who had a first-class ticket for this seaside resort find you? In a handbag. A handbag? Yes, I was in a handbag, Lady Bracknell. A, a somewhat large black leather handbag with, with handles to it. A very ordinary handbag, in fact. In what locality did this Mr. James or... Thomas, could you come across this ordinary handbag? In the cloakroom at Victoria Station. It was given to him in mistake for his own. The cloakroom at Victoria Station? Yes, the Brighton line. The line is immaterial. Mr. Worthing, I confess I am somewhat bewildered by what you have just told me. To be born, or at any rate bred, in a handbag, whether it had handles or not, Seems to me to display a contempt for the ordinary decencies of family life that reminds one of the worst excesses of the French Revolution. And I presume you know what that unfortunate movement led to. As to the particular locality in which the handbag was found, a cloakroom at a railway station might serve to conceal a social indiscretion. Indeed, has probably been used for that purpose more than once. But it could hardly be regarded as an assured basis for a recognised position in good society. May I ask you then what you would advise me to do? I need hardly say that I would do anything in the world to ensure Gwendolen's happiness. 
I would strongly advise you, Mr. Worthing, to try and acquire some relations as soon as possible and to make a definite effort to produce at any rate one parent of either sex before the season is quite over. I don't see how I could possibly manage to do that. I can produce the handbag at any moment it is in my dressing room at home. I really think that should satisfy you, Lady Bradley. Me, sir? What has it to do with me? You can hardly imagine that I and Lord Bracknell would dream of allowing our only daughter, a girl brought up with the utmost care, to marry into a cloakroom and form an alliance with a parcel. Kindly open the door for me, sir. You will, of course, understand that for the future there is to be no communication whatsoever between you and Miss Fairfax. Good day to you, sir. Good day, Lady Bracknell. Oh, for heaven's sake, Algy, don't play that ghastly tune. How many I'll take you up? <sighs> Did it go off all right, old boy? Well, don't mean to say that Gwendolyn refused you. I know it is the way she has. She's always refusing people. I think it is most ill-natured of her. Gwendolyn is right as a trivet. As far as she is concerned, we're engaged. Her mother is perfectly unbearable. I've never met such a gorgon. I don't even know what a gorgon is like, but I'm quite sure Lady Bracknell is one. In any case, she is a monster without being a myth, which is rather unfair. I beg your pardon, Algy. I suppose I shouldn't talk about your own aunt in that way before you. My dear boy, I love hearing my relations abused. It is the only thing that makes me put up with them at all. Relations are simply a tedious pack of people who haven't the remotest knowledge of how to live, nor the smallest instinct about when to die. Oh, that is nonsense. It isn't. Well, I won't argue about the matter. You always want to argue about things. But that is exactly what things were originally made for. Upon my word, if I thought that, I'd shoot myself. You don't suppose there's much chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Aunt? All women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. No man does. That's his. Is that clever? It is perfectly phrased. And quite as true as any observation in civilised life should be. I'm sick to death of cleverness. Everybody is so clever nowadays. One can't go anywhere without meeting clever people. The thing has become an absolute public nuisance. I wish to goodness we had a few fools left. We have. I should extremely like to meet them. What do they talk about? The fools. Or about the clever people, of course. What fools? By the way, did you tell Gwendolyn the truth about your being Ernest in town and Jack in the country? My dear fellow, the truth isn't quite the sort of thing one tells to a nice, sweet, refined girl. What extraordinary ideas you have about the way to behave to a woman. The only way to behave to a woman is to make love to her if she is pretty and to someone else if she is plain. That is nonsense. What about your brother? What about the profligate Ernest? Oh, before the end of the week, I shall have got rid of him. I shall say he died in Paris of apoplexy. Lots of people die of apoplexy quite suddenly, don't they? Yes, but it's hereditary, my dear fellow. It's a sort of thing that runs in families. No, you would much better say a severe chill. You are sure a severe chill isn't hereditary or anything of that kind? No, of course not. Very well. My poor brother Ernest is carried off in Paris quite suddenly by a severe chill. That gets rid of him. But I thought you said that Miss Cardew was a little too much interested in your poor brother Ernest. Won't she feel his loss a good deal? Oh, that's all right. Cecily is not, I'm glad to say, a silly romantic girl. She has a capital appetite, goes long walks and pays no attention at all to her lessons. I would rather like to see Cecily. I will take very good care you never do. She is excessively pretty and only just 18. Have you told Gwendolyn yet that you have an excessively pretty ward who is only just 18? Oh. One doesn't blurt these things out to people. Gwendolyn and Cecily are perfectly certain to be absolutely great friends. I bet you anything you like. That half an hour after they've met, they'll be calling each other sister. Women only do that when they've called each other a lot of other things first. Now, my dear boy, if we want a good table at Willis's tonight, we really must go and dress. Do you know it's nearly seven? Oh, it always is nearly seven. Well, I'm hungry. I never knew you when you weren't. Miss Fairfax. Gwendolyn, upon my word. Algy, kindly turn your back. I have something very particular to say to Mr. Worthing. No, really, Gwendolyn, I don't think I can allow this at all. Algy, you always adopt a strictly immoral attitude towards life. You are not quite old enough to do that. My own darling. Ernest, we may never be married. From the expression on Mama's face, I fear we never shall. Few parents nowadays pay any regard to what their children say to them. The old-fashioned respect for the young is fast dying out. Whatever influence I ever had over Mama, I lost at the age of three. But... Although she may prevent us from becoming man and wife, and I may marry someone else and marry often, nothing that she can possibly do can alter my eternal devotion to you. Oh, dear Gwendolyn. 
The story of your romantic origin is related to me by Mama, with unpleasing comments, has naturally stirred the deeper fibres of my nature. Your Christian name has an irresistible fascination. The simplicity of your character makes you exquisitely incomprehensible to me. Now, your town address at the Albany I have. What is your address in the country? The, the, the manor house. Woolton, Hertfordshire. There is a good postal service, I suppose. It may be necessary to do something desperate. That, of course, will require serious consideration. I will communicate with you daily. Oh, oh man. How long do you remain in town? Till Monday. Good. Algie, you may turn round now. Thanks, I've turned round already. You may also ring the bell. You will allow me to see you to your carriage, my own darling. Certainly. I shall see Miss Fairfax now. Yes. A glass of sherry, Lane. Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the Bunbury suits. Yes, sir. I hope tomorrow will be a fine day, Lane. It never is, sir. Lane, you are a perfect pessimist. I do my best to give satisfaction, sir. There's a sensible, intellectual girl. The only girl I ever cared for in my life. <laughs> what on earth are you so amused at? Oh, I'm a little anxious about poor Bunbury, that is all. If you don't take care, your friend Bunbury will get you into a serious scrape someday. I love scrapes. They are the only things that are never serious. No, that is nonsense. Algie, you never talk anything but nonsense. Nobody ever does.